Nancy got off the couch and wiped the special gel for ultrasound from her belly. The doctor smiled encouragingly at her, saying, Well done. It's your first pregnancy and twins at once. Your man will be thrilled. He's a paramedic, right? Yes, he's been in the field for three years, but I don't think this news will excite him, Nancy replied. Why is that? The talkative doctor immediately asked. Doesn't he like kids? Worse, Nancy responded sarcastically. We haven't even been intimate yet. Believe it or not. Saying this, she adjusted her medical uniform, attempted to smile, but managed only a pathetic grimace. The doctor was taken aback by these words. However, she quickly composed herself and refrained from asking the young woman any further questions. She was not there to solve the life circumstances of this attractive nurse. Having worked in the gynecology department for a long time, she understood well that children aren't always born to husbands and regular partners. After leaving the doctor's office, the young nurse felt bitter and alone. She was again persistently embraced from all sides by the feeling of hopelessness, which she had experienced many years ago, crossing the threshold of the orphanage. It was as if an evil fate had been hanging over her ever since she had been dropped off in a cardboard box at the orphanage in a small provincial town. How many souls are there in this world who have been so ruthlessly disposed of by their parents? Nancy walked around the hospital grounds, oblivious to her surroundings, and thinking bitterly about her life and what to say to John, who the doctor had mentioned at the ultrasound. They started dating two months ago, and almost at the start of their romance, John brought her to his house, whispering, I have a surprise for you, darling. But Nancy pushed away his insistent hands and said firmly, John, I'm not ready. I've never had a close relationship with men before. Hearing this, John laughed angrily in her face. A prude, you say? That's news to me. Well, I'm patient. I'll wait until you're ready. But a month later, Nancy learned that John had another woman with whom he started to spend days and nights. From then on, they were just acquaintances, nothing more. But Nancy was ashamed to speak openly about their breakup, so everyone in the hospital still thought they were a couple. She went through a series of state-run children's institutions, but no one wanted to adopt her. Everyone was confused by her story, who knows what kind of trouble-making parents she has? What if they're marginalised characters, beggars, alcoholics? No one would like to deal with a bad heredity. Nancy decided to go into medicine at an early age. One day, on a walk, she cleverly bandaged a boy's broken knee with a torn sleeve of her own dress. After that, she led the boy crying from pain to the nurse room and was completely enchanted by her magical office with shiny metal instruments on a pallet, the snow-white bandages, and even the smells of chlorine and ammonia. Everything was fascinating to her there. Nancy was a determined girl. While her peers were secretly smoking cigarettes around the corner of the utility block in the orphanage, she was focusing on biology and chemistry. Even the benefits for orphans at admission were not needed when she entered nursing school she did it independently and passed the entrance exams. Time of study passed like a flash, and then her adulthood arrived. Nursing might not be the most prestigious profession in the world, but in her separate apartment, with a diploma in hand, Nancy felt like a true adult, a self-reliant individual. Despite having little experience, Nancy quickly found a job. The head of the oncology department at the city hospital noticed her during her internship. When Nancy appeared in a ward, all patients began to smile, temporarily forgetting their pain. Her genuine and warm presence brought comfort. Despite not experiencing much love in her life, the young woman loved people unselfishly, devoting herself to them. She remained kind and resilient, and always wondered where she found the strength to give steadfast attention to those who suffered. Such compassionate professionals were invaluable in the department, where not all patients returned home. Everything was always clean, neat, and 
intelligently organised, whether at the nursing post during her shift or in each ward. It was hard to imagine anyone wanting to insult or harm someone like Nancy. Unfortunately, a negative incident did happen. Larry found himself in the ward through his family. His aunt, a respected surgeon with many years of experience, worked there. She had saved many patients' lives. Larry urgently needed to resolve his military service issues, ideally being deemed unfit for service. The contrast between Larry, who was faking a gastric oncology suspicion, and those genuinely sick was stark. He was a sociable young man, wealthy, with no obvious signs of the feared disease. However, in the hospital, it's not customary to meddle in others' affairs. If a bed is located to a patient, it must be for a good reason. Everything was going fine until Larry got bored. He noticed Nancy, petite, quiet and polite. He learned from his aunt that Nancy was an orphan with no one to protect her. So, he decided to have a little fun on the weekend, while the department was almost empty. He lured her into a storage room where mattresses, pillows and linens were stored. Nancy was stunned by his audacity and couldn't speak. Larry even clamped her mouth shut with his hand. When he realised that she was innocent, he became even more excited. What a surprise! Stay quiet and I will too. If you speak of this, you'll be out of a job in no time, he threatened, and after saying that, he released her. Nancy left the storeroom, looking frightened, down the corridor. It was quiet. All the other nurses were having tea and coffee with candy after dinner. Nancy carefully examined her clothes and tidied herself up. She was really afraid of being fired, but even more, she was terribly ashamed if someone found out about what had happened to her. So, she decided not to tell anyone and take this act as a terrible, ridiculous dream, which she should forget as soon as possible. Besides, Larry was soon discharged. Despite Nancy's medical education, she didn't immediately understand the serious implications of her encounter with an abusive patient. Her pregnancy proceeded without toxicosis or other complications. By the time she realised she was already twelve weeks pregnant. No, she was not frightened, but she was upset that she could not, with her income, become a decent mother for the baby. Being a bitter orphan herself, she could not even think of getting rid of the child. It's not his fault that his father is a real animal. And then he has her, his mother, and she will not abandon him under any circumstances. To seek help from Larry through his aunt was still disgusting to her. She couldn't bear the thought of being gossiped about, pitied or despised because of the violence done to her. Some might even think that she had seduced the rich nephew of a famous doctor for her own gain and promotion. Because of all these fears and the fact that there were no relatives around to give her a good advice, Nancy decided that no one would find out about the father of her child. When she heard during an ultrasound that she was expecting twins, Nancy despaired. She dreaded the thought of her offspring enduring a harsh, impoverished and underprivileged fate. It was bad at heart, but she had to return to work. Her patients were not to blame for the fact that everything in her life was about to change, and, most likely, in a bad direction. Ben Thompson was a wealthy businessman and heir to a large metallurgical corporation. He was a strong, willful and courageous man, traits recognised by everyone around him, from his young wife to his partners, colleagues and friends. He kept his past sorrows hidden deep within his soul, savouring the present and always looking optimistically towards the future. He was resilient, like a diamond that refused to be scratched by circumstances. But now, lying in the oncology ward, he seemed like an entirely different man. I'm about to become a helpless creature, obeying the orders of a terrible pain, he thought. My doctor was honest with me. A couple of months is all I really have. I can barely stand the agony from shot to shot even now. In my case, the disease is too advanced. The verdict is irrevocable. What do people who know they don't have long to live think about? 
Who knows? Probably each of them is thinking about something different. And Mr. Thompson found himself thinking about his beloved wife. How will she survive in this harsh world without me? He thought. He had already limited her visits here to the oncology department of the city hospital. He thought that it was not right for him, a mature man of fifty-five, to involve such a carefree creature on the web of his own and other people's suffering. He wanted to leave this world on his own, without unnecessary witnesses, no matter how much he loved this woman. Mr. Thompson grumbled even when his elderly father visited. He concocted reasons to avoid the meeting, claiming important tests, exhaustion, and longing for solitude. Despite his son's opposition, his father remained stubborn. But Michelle didn't mind coming less often. In her rare visits, she entered the room like a vibrant foreign butterfly, leaving a trail of exquisite perfume and spring freshness. She used to kiss him on the cheek and talk about her recent visits to stores and spas. She liked to drive dashingly and explore new places where her beauty was cherished, nurtured and created. It was a long-standing habit of a former model who left the catwalk at her husband's request. They met twelve years ago in Sicily, a place ripe for romantic adventures. Christina was shooting a series of commercials in the town of Teamina. This architectural gem, perched on a hilltop overlooking the Ionian Sea, provided the perfect backdrop. According to the director's plan, the heroine would enter the village through one of the gates, wander through the narrow streets where homeowners placed large pots of indoor flowers on their steps, and then sail to the island of Isola Bella, home to exotic animals and birds. These vibrant mini-stories promoted the purchase of sunglasses, a necessity in the hot Italian sun and on southern beaches. Despite the blinding sun and heat, Michelle switched between outfits and expressions effortlessly, always looking flawless on camera. Mr. Thompson was watching from afar the efforts of the film crew, who were languishing in the heat, thus spending his mini-vacation. The man had a meeting with his Italian partners on the mainland in three days. In Sicily, he intended to visit the filming locations of his favourite movie, The Godfather, and then sail from Messina directly to the mainland, so to speak, to mix business with pleasure. His romantic affair with Michelle bloomed like an exotic flower on the seaside. It was passionate and fiery, its heat affecting both of them. For the first time in years, Mr. Thompson fell deeply in love. Michelle reciprocated his feelings, desiring not gifts or money, but only him. She wanted to be alone with him, whether during walks, in their hotel room, or in a shady café. Mr. Thompson was losing his head, but did not want to resist it. After a family tragedy many years ago, he was finally living fully again. The misfortune retreated into the shadows. The successful businessman had already experienced two unsuccessful marriages. Both were early and hasty. His first marriage was to a fellow student, but it fell apart within months due to domestic issues. His wife detested household chores, and he was unwilling to ask his father for additional financial support. At that time, their family business was just starting to find its footing. His parents worked tirelessly, with his mother handling all the domestic responsibilities, while his father focused on the business. Megan, however, wanted a life of luxury and expected to live like the wife of a successful businessman. She was disappointed with the domestic workload and left, saying, Ben, I married the son of a businessman, not a kitchen hand. I expected a completely different level of life in your house. Your mother even does the dishes for everyone. I'm leaving. A few years later, he met another beautiful woman who had studied in London. Having lived in England, she saw herself as an aristocrat with impeccable manners. She was appalled by Ben's casual habits, such as leaving his socks near the bed, and not always dressing in a tuxedo or a classic suit. She tried to instill her English customs into their home, including organising tea parties for her like-minded friends. Ben's mother flatly refused to take part in these prim gatherings. 
she hurried to Ben's little sister, Amy, to take a walk with her in the park or read an interesting book. On one occasion, a ceremonious woman could no longer bear such a simple lifestyle, packed her suitcase and departed for her parents, who also greatly admired English traditions and rituals. Neither of Mr. Thompson's young wives considered the prospect of having children. They enjoyed the freedom of a life without the responsibilities of diapers or feeding bottles. After two unsuccessful marriages, Mr. Thompson shifted to short, non-committal relationships. He indulged in vacation flings, where the rules of engagement were clear. Enjoy a beautiful time at his expense, then part ways without any obligations. He would consider a serious relationship if one of his temporary girlfriends became pregnant, but such an occasion never arose. This lifestyle continued until he met Michelle. His younger sister Amy was 15 years younger. On occasions when their parents went out for the evening, they would spend time together. These were happy times. Ben Thompson would make hot sandwiches with sausage and cheese, and they would enjoy these sandwiches with tomato juice, watch old cartoons and have pillow fights. Amy would always fall asleep on her older brother's broad shoulder. Then, tragically, she passed away. Mr. Thompson didn't know before that he could howl like a wounded wolf in full voice. His little sister was crushed by a truck right at the bus stop. Amy usually rode to and from school in her father's company car. One day, she asked the driver to let her walk to the bus stop with her friend, the birthday girl, carrying gifts and coloured balloons getting from her classmates. The driver, who was speeding, would later blame the accident on the balloons, claiming they closed the bus stop. However, post-accident tests would reveal a high level of alcohol in his blood. At that concentration, he may well have lost the ability to react quickly to a difficult traffic situation. But what did it change? Nothing. In the terrible accident, five people were killed on the spot. Mr. Thompson, who arrived before anyone else, did not see Amy's body. He only found her red hat with a pom-pom and white patterns in a dirty pile of crumpled balloons. And the frightened driver of his father's company car stood nearby, excusing himself. I couldn't help it, Mr. Thompson, he lamented. She wanted to walk with her friend and help carry the balloons. Now they're both gone. I'll never forgive myself for this mistake. What followed were the lifeless eyes of Mr. Thompson's mother, the endless grief of the father, who soon stepped back from the business, passing the reins of power to his 27-year-old son. Mr. Thompson's mother never fully recovered from her tragic loss. She used to clutch her daughter's favourite doll, appearing almost insane as she tried to sleep. Mr. Thompson once found her reading fairy tales to the doll, Despite an examination at the clinic confirming her sanity, she was visibly fading with each passing day. She insisted that Amy visited her in dreams, expressing fear of being alone in cold darkness and pleading for her mother to save her. One morning, Mr. Thompson's mother didn't rise from her bed, and three days later, she passed away. Her husband discovered her smiling peacefully, as if her deepest wish had been fulfilled. She was reunited with her daughter. The truck driver was convicted and received a hefty sentence, but of course it didn't bring back the deceased. Mr. Thompson couldn't drive for a long time, not from fear, but because of the vivid memories associated with driving. Balloons, a hat, a red pom-pom, Amy's laughter, her playful pillow fights, and the dozens of snow-white and scarlet roses on his mother's grave. Anything related to cars and the road became a source of deep pain. That's why he was always anxious when his wife Michelle decided to drive. He didn't even like to watch the process. When his wife got into the car, he stayed away from the garage. He was not afraid of anything else in his life, but he could not overcome this fear in himself. Meanwhile, Nancy was sitting in a pastry shop, where John 
had invited her for lunch. The woman absent-mindedly smeared chocolate, which had topped a tempting cake around her saucer. She was contemplating whether to share her important news with him. Finally, trusting the friendship she thought remained between them, she began the difficult conversation. John, I have something to tell you. I'm pregnant. The young man froze, unable to bring a cup of coffee to his lips, then suddenly erupted. What are you saying? Did you give in to another man? Was he more attractive than me? I'm only friends with you out of pity for your orphanhood. Do you remember Saint Exupery's legendary saying in The Little Prince? We are responsible for those we tame. Here, and I tamed you, as a homeless, no one needs a puppy. Nancy was at a loss for words. She hoped that John was still her friend, and thought she would get one single word of encouragement from him. But what was she feeling right now? Disappointment. Shock. Hurt. She had been excluded so many times in her life. She felt like she was back in a cardboard box, without even a warm blanket, hoping against hope for survival. Her heart was breaking. Another betrayal. How many more losses was life going to throw her way? She didn't explain anything. Her confession about the terrible incident in the hospital storeroom was unlikely to change John's attitude towards her. He had already severed their friendship, if it ever existed. Nancy rose from the table and left the café. Once again, she felt like a lost puppy, unwanted and abandoned. She didn't expect John to suddenly become a noble knight, offering to marry her and save her from disgrace, or to claim her children as his own. Being a single mother was no longer considered extraordinary or rare. She just wanted some kind of support. At the hospital, Nancy was called to the head of the department. He shut the door behind her and said, Nancy, I have a delicate assignment for you. An unusual patient, a close friend and sponsor of our hospital, was admitted to us a few days ago, and he was diagnosed with stage 4 gastric cancer. His case has reached a point where a miracle is unlikely. The metastases have spread in various directions, affecting the organs and tissues around the stomach. As a result, he is in considerable pain. He stays in the VIP ward. He confided that he chose our hospital to spend his remaining days. He is a man of strong will, showing no whims or tantrums, and he doesn't want to burden his loved ones. He has no children, his father is elderly, and his wife is young. Mary usually oversees this ward, but she requested leave to accompany her asthmatic son to a seaside sanatorium. So, you'll be in charge of this ward. Your new ward's name is Mr. Thompson. Please treat him with all the affection and attention you are capable of. He's a man of worth. Our earth holds on people like him. He is not snobbish, not proud, not arrogant, despite his wealth. I want you to get along with him. I want him to be as comfortable as possible, even in his hopeless situation. Don't worry. I'll do everything right. You don't have to doubt me, Nancy said with a sad smile. To die alone, without the support of loved ones, is a terrible fate. I understand what it feels like to be lonely in a crowd of strangers, or worse, indifferent individuals. It requires great courage to face such a situation. The head of the department felt an unsettling sadness in the voice of one of his best nurses, which sent a chill down his spine. However, a phone call distracted him, and he quickly forgot about his fleeting sensation. Nancy quickly left his office, not wanting to take up any more of the boss's time. She understood her assignment well. When Nancy entered room number 10, she was well prepared. She wore a warm smile, her medical uniform was impeccable, and she held a device for setting up drips. The patient, Mr. Thompson, had a strange reaction to her appearance. He stared at her as if he had seen a ghost, which almost made her drop the drip. She forgot all the words she had planned to say and started to stammer. "'Good afternoon. I'm your new nurse. Mary is on leave. My name is Nancy. 
Do you have any requests or needs at the moment? The patient remained in a daze for a while, then slowly came to his senses, gave a strained smile, and replied, You resemble my little sister greatly. You took me back at first. I don't have any wishes or requests yet. If I need you, I'll summon you, said Mr. Thompson, wishing for Nancy's swift departure. Tears welled up in his eyes, not wanting anyone to witness his vulnerability. His astonishment was boundless. Nancy looked just like Amy, only older. The same grey eyes, framed by fluffy lashes, similar eyebrows and lips. He thought if his mother saw Nancy now, she would faint. Their figures were almost identical. However, Amy was already in her early forties, and this young nurse was clearly much younger. Nevertheless, the resemblance was uncanny. Mr. Thompson pondered that Amy's daughter could resemble his nurse. How sad and irreversible it all seemed. Such encounters in life often lead to ambivalent thoughts, and Nancy's patient was no exception. After she left, he immediately called his father to come to the hospital. He said he would explain the urgency in person. The elderly man came immediately. The first thing Mr. Thompson did was invite his new nurse to the room under a plausible pretext. "'Nancy, my father's here to see me. Would you mind making us a couple of cups of herbal tea?' He watched his father's facial expressions carefully, but detected nothing unusual. After Nancy had left the ward, a frank conversation took place between the two men. "'Dad, don't you think this girl bears a striking resemblance to our Amy? When I first saw her, I couldn't believe it.' "'Of course I've noticed,' he said. "'Have you considered that she might be the aftermath of one of her fleeting romances, my son?' "'Father, we've never discussed personal matters before. "'Let me tell you why I'm certain Nancy has nothing to do with me. "'For a long time, I've had a thorough security. "'After breaking up with a woman, they follow her for a few months to see if she gets pregnant. "'I've always wanted a child, but it never happened.' If one of my women were to become pregnant, I would take an active role in her and the baby's life. Now, I have the same question for you. Mum's been gone for years. I only know about one of your companions. Maybe you had other girlfriends? Don't think my curiosity is idle or tactless. The new nurse's appearance struck me. No, son. There was only ever Helen. We met when I was in my fifties and she was about the same age. She saved me from the loneliness I felt after losing your mother and sister, and became a loyal good friend. Of course we were close, but we never thought about having a child. Helen already had a son, nearly your age. It's time for us to expect grandchildren, not to become parents again. Mr. Thompson pondered this, still troubled by the mystery. He wondered why Nancy looked so much like his deceased sister. He then proposed a new theory. Dad, could this girl be a distant relative? His father once again denied this possibility. To the best of my knowledge, we don't have any blood relatives on my side or your mother's. I'm familiar with all the distant nephews and nieces, and they live quite far away. Throughout our lives, we've only seen them two or three times, and we've lost touch. Life has separated us. Not satisfied with that answer either, Mr. Thompson had another idea, which he shared with his father. Why speculate? I'll have my security team compile a full dossier on this nurse. That should clarify things. And so they agreed with that decision. At this moment, Nancy arrived with tea. The men asked about her work in this department and her education. She answered all their questions in detail even sharing a story from her time at the orphanage, when she had bandaged a boy's knee wound and subsequently fallen into love with medicine. The conversation ended on a friendly note. Both sides knew how to find common language with unfamiliar people. The following day, Mr. Thompson instructed his security chief to investigate. Nobody could have anticipated that the nurse's story would be so difficult to unravel. 
Three days later, Mr. Thompson received the report of the trip to the town where the orphanage was located. He meticulously examined all the documents and was astounded. Neither the law enforcement agency nor his employees could trace the origins of the newborn girl left at the children's institution in an old cardboard box. For Nancy, her wealthy ward patient, and the rest of the world, the girl's origins remained a profound mystery. Mr. Thompson was forced to concede that he was helpless in this situation. Wealth can't solve everything, and the mystery of Nancy's parents remained unsolved. She stayed at the orphanage until ninth grade, studied at the local medical college, graduated with honours, lived in a rented apartment, worked in the city's hospitals, oncology department, and had some kind of relationship with a paramedic. That was the extent of it. Nancy's biography was as small and mystical as she was, containing just a page. Everything was straightforward and clear. Nancy was running down the corridor after a man who did not want to put on a robe and shoe covers. He was extremely rude and agitated, demanding to be shown to the ward where Mr. Thompson was staying. The nurse tried her best not to allow a scandal, because it was obvious that the visitor was looking for Mr. Thompson with ill intentions. Nancy and the baffling guest burst in the ward number 10 together. The guest immediately rushed towards the patient's bed. What followed was horrifying. The visibly upset visitor approached Mr. Thompson, grabbed his hand and yelled, You rich people think you can do anything! I despise you! I would spit right in your face! Nancy attempted to shield Mr. Thompson, but the unruly visitor brusquely pushed her aside, saying, Don't get in my way! I need to speak to this audacious, disgusting man and look him in his shameless eyes. His wife is hiding from me! behind a tall fence of private property. Completely bewildered, Mr. Thompson quietly asked, What's the problem? What has Michelle done to upset or hurt you? The man paused momentarily before launching back into his tirade. Upset me? Is that what they call it now? She destroyed me by ruining my loved ones. Nancy and her patient listened confused, deciding it was best to let the man vent his feelings. My wife was crossing the road on a green light, pushing a stroller with our youngest daughter and leading our oldest son by the hand. Your wife's car hit all three of them. They are in the hospital now. My wife is in serious condition. Do you know how a man feels who has almost lost three of his most beloved people overnight? Mr. Thompson felt a sense of deja vu, the halt, the inflatable balloons, the red-knit cap, the internal void and chill. Perhaps there's a mistake. Michelle could not have committed such a heinous act. Yes, she loves cars and speed, but to run over a person? It could not have happened, because it could never have happened. The visitor twitched nervously, glaring at his wealthy adversary. Do you think your beautiful wife... An angel incarnate can't turn into a demon. She's so delicate, so fragile, so airy. I went to see her, wanting to look her in the eye to understand how she could ignore the victims and flee the crime scene. I see they're keeping you in the dark, protecting your nerves. Your wife hired a slew of lawyers when they identified her from the surveillance footage and traced the car's ownership. She was arrested and released almost immediately. Now she's at home, lying low, nursing her wounds with wine. You wonder how I know all this? Some good Samaritans found me, informed me, and showed me the footage. Mr. Thompson was in disbelief. Michelle was well aware of the tragedy involving his younger sister. She knew that ever since then he had tried to avoid cars on the 10th road, only using motorised transport when necessary. The notion that his wife could be so reckless on the road was absurd, nonsensical and fantastical. Mr. Thompson didn't argue with his adversary, noticing the man was broken by the calamity that had befallen him. Look, you're right that I don't know anything about this case, but believe me, 
I will look into everything and of course if my wife is guilty she will be punished. And I will compensate all your expenses and damages. And your family will be taken care of by the best doctors. Nancy, who became an unwitting witness to the man's monologue, did not know how to behave. On the one hand, as an employee of a severe oncology ward, she had to shield her patient from this kind of intrusive scene. On the other hand, in such a situation, it would be cruel to prevent two people from talking about the accident and its consequences. Meanwhile, the visitor began to retreat, looking as if he had completed a challenging mission. He left without a word, visibly drained. Mr. Thompson also seemed distressed and deep in thought. Nancy later overheard him instructing the security team to get him the video footage of the accident. Later that day, Nancy ran into John in the emergency room, and he didn't hesitate to make a mean joke about her. I see our mummy-to-be is living and working quite serenely. He snorted contemptuously and walked toward the ambulance, but it was too late. The nurse, having listened to their conversation, clung to Nancy with a dead grip. Nancy, are you pregnant? Or what? You know, yesterday in the dining room at lunch, I thought about you, that you are so tiny, but it seemed as if you were eating for two. For three, Nancy didn't lie. I'll have twins, sixteen weeks along. Her colleague was stunned and immediately asked, Isn't John the father of the babies? Everyone in the hospital thinks you two are together, and he's so angry with you now. Did you cheat on him? Nancy frowned. John is not the father of my future children. That's how it is. Let's drop this topic. It's unpleasant for me. I'd appreciate it if this conversation stays between us. Almost all my clothes are becoming tight. I'll wear my uniform a size larger. Soon everyone will know about my condition. Let that happen later rather than sooner. Later in the department, Nancy, recalling John's harsh words, broke into tears. She had been on duty for almost 24 hours, and it had been a difficult day. A call from the Mr. Thompson's ward came at the most inconvenient moment. She barely had time to dry her eyes. Mr. Thompson was a perceptive man. He saw the crying eyes of the nurse at once, but at first he only reminded her that he was due for an anaesthetic injection soon, and asked her to give it a little earlier, because he had no strength to endure the severe pain any longer. Nancy checked the schedule. Before the injection was only twenty minutes, and thought, he's such a brave man, yet he can't endure it. Fifteen minutes later, she went in to check on the patient. Just as she was about to leave, assured he was feeling better, he suddenly grabbed her hand. Now, Nancy, tell me, why were you crying today? He said. His tone wasn't demanding. Rather, it was filled with so much empathy that she couldn't hold back her emotions. She confided in him about her foolish affair with John, the audacious Larry who took advantage of her on the weekend, and her fear of conflict with the influential doctor. She also told him about her pregnancy and the twins she was expecting. Upon hearing this, Mr. Thompson was enraged. Tomorrow we'll dot all the dots in this disgusting story, and that doctor's despicable nephew will pay for his actions. I have the power and money to make sure of it, believe me. Nancy pleaded. Please, don't. I genuinely enjoy working here. A scandal would leave me without a job or means of living, she said in a trembling voice. Mr. Thompson studied the young woman, whose life he was about to disrupt significantly. He had been in a state of anxious anticipation since the departure of the man who accused his wife of a heinous crime. By tomorrow, he would know whether Michelle was guilty or not, and now he was determined to make justice prevail, at least for Nancy. The head of the department did not dare refuse Mr. Thompson's request to meet with one of the hospital surgeons. Most likely, the important patient wanted to consult the specialist. That was his right. Unfortunately, even the most advanced surgery couldn't perform miracles in such a severe situation. 
The patient was already on his deathbed. Medicine was powerless. If the head of the department overheard the conversation between Mr. Thompson and his employee, he would be astoundingly surprised. Mr. Thompson spoke directly. I know you used your official position to help your nephew avoid military service due to health reasons. Do you know what he has done? The woman paled, then blushed deeply, asking quietly, What do you mean? What has he done? He committed a crime, a horrible one. He assaulted a nurse who is now expecting twins. Such offences are punishable by law. My influence will be enough to put him away for a long time. I think you know what happens to such people in prison. It serves as a reminder of the consequences of their actions towards their helpless victims. This can't be. Larry is a good, polite boy. I'll bring him to the hospital immediately. Let him explain in person that this is a misunderstanding, a false accusation. As a doctor, you know a DNA test will quickly resolve any doubts, but I want to confront him personally. I want to look him in the eye and hear his explanation. Larry arrived at the hospital, bewildered at his aunt's request. The surprise in Ward Number 10 was harsh. He was met by Mr. Thompson, his aunt, terrified Nancy, and the head of Mr. Thompson's security service. The conversation was difficult, but soon Larry confessed. I don't know what came over me. Everything was a blur. I'm ready to marry the girl I wronged, especially since she expects my children. Nancy recoiled at this. Please, Mr. Thompson, don't punish me more. I can't bear to see him. He disgusts me both physically and morally. I'll raise my children myself without this freak. Larry was distraught. Am I going to jail now, Auntie? I won't survive in prison. I'll be broken, destroyed. Mr. Thompson considered for a moment before passing his verdict. Since Nancy doesn't want anything to do with Larry, we'll do it differently. You'll go to the army. I'll ensure it happens as soon as possible. Now leave my room. He directed the surgeon and his nephew. No crime goes unpunished. The young man will regret his despicable act for a long time. I'll personally see to it. After Nancy, ashamed Larry and his aunt had left the room, he impatiently turned to his assistant. What's the news about my wife's supposed car accident? Are there any updates? The guard, avoiding eye contact, replied with a downcast look. Chief, I will connect you with the investigator now. I'm afraid you may not like the news. Please, wait for a video call, and I will leave the room. Mr. Thompson grabbed the tablet. The video call didn't take long. Perhaps it would have been better if he had remained ignorant. The screen displayed a close-up of the horrific accident and his wife's inebriated grin. The test results indicated that she had consumed at least half a bottle of cognac or whiskey before driving. The man was shocked and devastated by the scene. His wife's beautiful face showed no signs of remorse. Had he spent all these years with a heartless monster? The next clip was of Michelle's interrogation in a windowless room. He felt a moment of pity for her, but it quickly faded. He had never known his wife to be like this. The young beauty was cynically arguing to the two interviewers that a little wine had no effect on her driving concentration. Then she made a statement that sent chills down Mr. Thompson's spine. You all remind me of my husband here. For so many years he has been carrying around memories of the accident that killed his sister. It wasn't her fate. And he's like some kind of dummy, still sheds tears, and goes to the grave with flowers. Mr. Thompson recoiled in disgust. The scene unfolding on the screen was unfathomable to him. He had loved and idolised this woman, believing there were two halves of a whole destined for each other, the perfect husband and wife. Yet it was all an illusion, 
a deception, a mistake. She had betrayed all his feelings. Only feigning to share his suffering and longing for his sister and mother, she was not with him for him, but for his millions. He began to recall alarming details, minor yet significant. For example, Michel had not wanted children, brushing off his requests as innocent jests. This woman had been allowed everything. Mr. Thompson had melted under her touch and swooned like only a man in love could. Known as a stern and serious man outside, he had relaxed at home, allowing her to take the reins, only to ensure that she was next to him. Mr. Thompson watched the video multiple times. He always paid attention to the details, and now he noticed that even during the interrogation, Michelle appeared to be intoxicated. A thought occurred to him. She's celebrating my imminent death, and her future affluent freedom. I need to revise my will urgently, but I need to do it carefully, considering every step. Nancy quietly entered the chamber, a large basket of flowers in her hands. Mr. Thompson, please forgive my intrusion, without your calling first. Larry sent me these flowers and some sweets. I've given the cake and candy to the nurses without specifying the sender. I was going to discard the flowers, but I couldn't bear to. They're still alive and innocent. May I place them in your ward? The man observed her, a new plan forming in his mind, and he replied to the woman, While I don't appreciate Larry's generosity, the flowers shouldn't suffer for it. Place them on the window sill, and there's a serious conversation we need to have. I'm going to require your active assistance. Michelle was frustrated at getting entangled in such nonsense. Her carefully orchestrated operation to accomplish her ultimate goal was falling apart. How did that woman and her children end up on that unfortunate crosswalk? She and her friend had been chatting in a bar, oblivious to how much they had drunk, including undiluted whiskey on the rocks. When she got into her car, she felt slightly dizzy, but she had driven frequently enough to not consider it a hindrance. In such a pricey car with conspicuous license plates, she was rarely stopped by the traffic police. Her journey to tomorrow's important meeting in her husband's ward was a long one. Tomorrow, his will will be signed. His health was failing and time was running out. With his impending demise, his wife was already contemplating life without him. She envisioned a life with his millions, free to live for herself. She dreamt of companionship with younger, robust men, rather than her ageing, ailing husband. Her husband had been a good man, strong-willed, passionate and determined. The issue lay in their substantial age difference. She felt improper in social settings with him, unable to enjoy the company of her peers with her much older husband by her side. Her friends often said, Michelle, you're so lucky. Your husband spoils you with gifts, never denies you anything, and fulfills your every wish. But his adoration couldn't quench Christina's yearning for more. She believed that her beauty deserved more than just material gifts. She desired a partner who appealed to her heart. She looked forward to living a hassle-free life on the inheritance she would receive after his death. Fortunately, her husband never had children, so there would be no sponges on his treasures. The woman uncorked another bottle of wine, her smile predatory. With her remarkable beauty, she knew she could charm even a high-priced lawyer into quickly fixing her detainment for a minimal fee. Her primary concern was ensuring Ben remained unaware of her mishap until after the final signing of the will. However, she would be definitely able to convince him it wasn't her fault, that it was a scheme against her. Michelle prepared meticulously for her trip to the hospital. She wanted her husband to be captivated by her beauty, to realise again the joy and light she brought into his life. She wore a scarlet pantsuit, snow-white blouse, and high heels that highlighted her long legs. Her red hair was tied back 
in a voluminous ponytail, and she wore small ruby earrings, a gift from Mr. Thompson. Her green eyes reflected love and devotion. A dash of his favourite perfume on her wrists completed her look. The image of a perfect woman, the dream of any man, devoted to her husband alone. Picking up her purse from the chair, Michelle headed to the hospital to see her husband. She was filled with anticipation, believing that today would mark a victory of a cunning and beauty over male trust and naivety. Outside their home, she admired their surroundings and thought again about how she would soon be a wealthy widow. Michelle started to count her potential assets with the immaculately manicured fingers. There was a successful company that her husband co-owned with a reliable long-term family friend, a summer house tucked away on the sea coast, where she and Mr. Thompson enjoyed spending time. Their primary residence was a house outside the city, modelled after a chalet in the Swiss Alps. There was also a delightful small house on the Mediterranean coastline, which Michelle enjoyed visiting with her friend to attend fashion shows in Paris and Milan, followed by relaxing under the shade of lush olive and orange trees. Additionally, they owned three city apartments, a couple of cars for business and social outings, and an entire floor of the house furnished as a dressing room. Despite these city apartments seeming modest in comparison, they were also designed in the finest modern classical style. Michelle considered it a bad taste to wear the same outfit more than ten times. She had a penchant for bright, flashy jewellery with many stones, the bigger the better. Suddenly, she remembered her sin, occasionally visiting her in the form of a secret rebuke, awakened conscience. After parting ways with Mr. Thompson in Sicily for some time, she continued to fulfil her advertising contracts. This included a job in Tunisia, where her colleagues persuaded her to take a trip to the Sahara Desert. After spending a night in a hotel situated in an oasis amid the sandy and salty wastelands, they visited an oriental market for souvenirs. Separated from the rest, an elderly woman dressed in rags was selling spices. As Michelle approached her, the woman switched to fluent French, a language Michelle was well versed in. Are you looking for something special, young lady? I have something for you. Buy this dried aromatic herb from me, and use it for cooking your favourite meat and fish. They will stick to you. They won't tear off. It's inexpensive. Only one hundred dollars for this big pack. Michelle laughed in response. What are you thinking, old witch? I'll charm any man with my own allure. I can do it without your help. The dweller of the Sahara Desert grinned. What will you do when you grow tired of him? Take my herb, don't be stubborn. People like you want everything their way. There will be a time when you can use my herb to make him suffer. It'll look like a terrible illness, not poisoning. Be careful. Don't use more than a pinch, or you'll kill your lover prematurely. Michelle's subsequent actions were peculiar. She appeared hypnotized, having bought the herb from the old woman. As their tour group traversed the sand dunes in a jeep, she held the package in her hands. The package felt alive to her, radiating a mysterious yet promising warmth. Back home, Michelle often invited Mr. Thompson to her cosy apartment, where she spiced up their dinners with small particles of herbs. He always praised her cooking. Their nights together were intense and tender, as if they were completely immersed in each other. During those happy times, Michelle quickly forgot about the old woman's warnings. They eventually got married and spent a few serene, romantic years together. However, Michelle began to grow weary of her significantly older spouse. A twenty-five-year age gap between a man and a woman can feel like a chasm. Should such a marriage be called a mésalliance? Ben and Michelle never pondered this question. Or perhaps only Mr. Thompson didn't, while Michelle having paid a hundred dollars for a bright future, had already implemented her insidious plan. About two years ago, she started adding spices to Mr. Thompson's meals again. Her intention was not to kill him, 
as she was not that malicious. Instead, it was an attempt to rekindle their relationship, to make it vibrant again. After eating meals prepared by his wife, Mr. Thompson became particularly affectionate and passionate. This kept him in high spirits for a long time. Suddenly, like a thunderclap, a severe fatal disease struck Mr. Thompson. The symptoms were clear, but it was too late. Always busy, he sought medical help when there was nothing left to do. He chose to die alone in the hospital instead of in front of his wife, and Michelle was deeply grateful for his decision. Upon hearing the news of his illness, Michelle drowned her sorrows in alcohol, then retracted and accepted the inevitable. She resumed her former carefree life and waited patiently. At 10 a.m., a group of notable individuals gathered in room number 10 at Mr. Thompson's. Among them was Michelle, who arrived with a notary. She did not expect to see such an assembly. The head of the security service with a subordinate, Mr. Thompson's father, and his business partner. Everyone was surprised to be brought together, but did not show it. The sick man did not keep them in suspense for long. He addressed the gathering. "'Gentlemen, I am grateful that you found the time to visit me in the hospital. I have some astonishing news to share. My security team has confirmed one of my assumptions. They traced the path of my tumultuous youth and found my adult daughter in a small town. I will introduce her to you now.' Mr. Thompson pressed the nurse's call button. Everyone, except for the security representatives, exchanged surprised looks. When Nancy entered the room, Mr. Thompson gently steered her into the centre of the room, saying, "'Don't be shy, my dear. These are the people closest to me. This is Nancy, my lost daughter. Please treat her kindly.' Various emotions played across the faces of those present. Michelle was taken aback. Mr. Thompson's father was baffled, as it was certain that Nancy had no family ties with them, the family friend, who had known the family for many years, and remembered Amy, was also shocked. The adult copy of Amy standing before him made him shudder. Genetics had reproduced in this nurse the forgotten features of the departed Amy. Only the notary, who was privy to the changes in the will, remained silent. His stoic expression was a requirement of professional ethics. Nancy quietly smiled, playing the role of Mr. Thompson's daughter. It was not the most impossible request on his part to her, and only she alone knew how he was suffering. With the exclusive permission of the attending physician, she had even injected him, today, a heavier painkiller. He would pay for it in separate agonies tomorrow. Meanwhile, thanks to her efforts, he was holding up splendidly. After his help with Larry, she decided to do something nice for Mr. Thompson. Why not engage in this peculiar prank? Mr. Thompson, already tired of the crowd, continued, While Nancy prepares tea or coffee for all of us, and before I present this wonderful cake we bought, I would like to speak alone with my wife. I hope you won't mind waiting in the hallway. Michelle was uneasy about this start. Why was the notary being asked to leave? This behaviour was very unusual for her husband, who cared for her deeply. However, he didn't leave her guessing, but quickly stated his position. Michelle, I know about the crime you committed on the road, your callous indifference towards the people you had hurt, and how you pretended to understand and care about my memories of my sister and mother all these years. I despise lies and hypocrisy. God will be your judge. But I've changed the terms of my will, after my death, you won't be poor. I've arranged for a monthly allowance of two thousands. The rest of your inheritance is no longer yours. Otherwise, if you don't agree, I'll do my best to put you in jail. So far, my millions have been able to stop all investigations against you. But this process is reversible. What? The woman leapt up from her chair in anger. You have lost your mind with all those injections your daughter is giving you. How did she appear here in the ward dressed as a nurse? Are you playing a prank on me? Admit it. Her voice suddenly softened, 
becoming as sweet as molasses and as smooth as mountain honey, replacing her previous shrill tone. Michelle decided to shift her approach, attempting to smooth things over. She embraced her husband, nuzzled her nose against his shoulder, and cooed. The unbearable pain has changed you, darling. I'm not to blame for what happened. It was a tragic coincidence. I lost control for a moment. Mr. Thompson looked at his wife, feeling as if he were viewing her through rose-coloured glasses that first cracked, then shattered, piercing his soul. It felt as if a fog was lifting, an obsession waning, and love donning a mourning dress for his former feelings. He realised that the woman beside him had only been playing the role of a lover, skillfully controlling his heart like a puppeteer with a marionette. Love can be very evil. Recognising that her act had no effect on her husband, Michelle turned abruptly and stormed out of the room. She did not wait for the tea that Nancy was preparing in the mini-kitchen, but instead hissed in the notary's ear, "'We'll meet in court later!' Michelle wouldn't show up in Mr. Thompson's ward again, not that day or the following week. The next day, Mr. Thompson had a conversation with his father and the nurse, during which he explained to them what his wife had done, why he had played this theatre with the will. Nancy, you can argue, but I've already decided everything. I will leave you and your children a portion of my fortune. In order for Michelle to have no chance to protest this, I'm going to adopt you and really make you my daughter. Nancy was, of course, shocked, but did not resist this generous offer, especially since it was about the safety of her children. A couple of days later, he finally went into a semi-conscious state, writhing in pain, which now finally claimed him. Edward was sitting near ward number seven, where his ailing mother lay, bewildered, exhausted and angry. As her condition deteriorated, he felt helpless. The sight of her eyes, filled with incomprehensible pain, was too much for him to bear. It was not yet time for her next injection. He glanced at his watch, but the time seemed to stand still, each minute stretching into an eternity. Across the hall in room number ten, doctors bustled about, a young nurse frequently rushed out, carrying a drip device or a glass item to the room. Edward attempted to remind her about his mother's upcoming injection, but she seemed to look right through him, mumbling incoherently. However, his worry was unnecessary. After ten minutes, the nurse entered his mother's ward, adjusted her bed, administered the injection, took her temperature, and then turned to Edward. "'You haven't been away for twenty-four hours.' and I noticed that you hadn't eaten anything all day. Your mother will feel better for a couple of hours. Join me in the nurse's room for some tea and sandwiches. I only had breakfast today, and it's been twelve hours since that, she said. No, I don't want to impose, Edward replied, suddenly feeling starving. I had prepared a snack at home, but I left the package on the table in my rush. I bet our cat has already found it. I'm not sure about the bread, but the sausage most likely has been eaten. Suddenly a noise echoed from the corridor. Nancy rushed towards it, returning fifteen minutes later. She spoke sorrowfully. Well, that's it. Mr. Thompson has passed on. He was such a kind-hearted patient. I cared for him as if he were my own father. He often joked, calling me his daughter. Now I feel as though I've lost a loved one. I still can't get used to that in my job. After a pause, she asked, By the way, what's your name? Edward. Edward, I'm sorry. Don't listen to me. It's just fatigue. Many people leave our hospital well treated. I hope God and our doctors will help your mother to leave this hospital by her own feet. Let's have coffee instead of tea. I'm on duty until morning and my patient doesn't need me any more. I'll help you and your mother. In psychology, there's a concept called the hitchhiker effect. 
It's when strangers on transport, roads, or long journeys share their stories with a random travelling companion. So this night and duty were for Nancy, filled with the hitchhiker effect. She told Edward everything about herself as it was. He told her he was also an orphan, but not for long. The woman now living out her days in Ward Number no. Seven adopted him, raised him, educated him. Soon he will graduate from university, stop working evenings as a pizza delivery boy, and find a decent job. But now he didn't know how to repay his filial debt. He tried to be there all the time, but it was no use. The train of hope had already left, and he also needed to accept it, to come to terms with it. Since that night, Edward and Nancy often talked when she had a free minute. They were together when his mother last opened her eyes and smiled weakly at him, saying, "Everything will be fine, son. You just believe." Since that night, Edward began to visit Nancy after the university. When there was an evening without the courier rides around the city, they went to the movies, walked in the park, ate ice cream on the bench, talked a lot. It was the case when two lonely people met, destitute and unattached. They began to support each other. Edward was aware that a week after Mr. Thompson's death, his family and Nancy had been summoned by a notary. The deceased man had bequeathed the majority of his real estate in equal shares to his father and recently discovered daughter, Michelle. Instead of attending herself, sent her lawyer, with whom she was involved romantically. Despite his growing affection for Nancy, Edward did not intend to pursue her at this time. He wanted to establish himself independently before considering marriage. Nancy suspected his feelings for her. However, her pregnancy and increasing workload distracted her. Mr. Thompson had willed his assets in the company to his partner, under the condition that all profits from his share were directed to the city's hospital's trauma department. This allowed them to soon invest in new diagnostic equipment, potentially saving the life of someone involved in a severe traffic accident. Eventually, Nancy took maternity leave. Now she didn't need to work, and could focus on her dream of graduating from the medical school. She dusted off her old chemistry and biology textbooks, and felt relieved that she didn't have to worry about her son's financial future any more. The second ultrasound revealed that she was carrying twin boys. The legal service of Mr. Thompson was tasked with assisting Nancy with all property-related issues. Despite her newfound wealth. Nancy's character and habits remained unchanged. She didn't become callous, arrogant, or indifferent to others. Only John, the paramedic, could not live in peace. He regretted his actions, realizing he had missed out on a relationship with a wealthy heiress. He had never imagined that she would turn out to be a millionaire's daughter, and had always mocked her for being an orphan. One day, John decided to visit Nancy again at her old address. In one of her new apartments, where she was going to move after the maternity hospital, a nursery for two babies was being set up, and she was slowly packing up her old apartment. When the doorbell rang sharply, she assumed it was the movers who had forgotten something. However, it was John standing at the threshold. Nancy, I came to make amends. You misunderstood me. I've always been sincere with you. You misinterpreted my words. I'm not angry with you, John, but you're too late. I'm getting married soon. Let me introduce you to my future husband, Edward. Could you come here, please? Edward appeared in the hallway, and Nancy briefly explained, "This is my ex-boyfriend, John. He came to visit us. I told him that we're getting married next month. Don't you mind?" That I shared our joy with an old friend of mine. Saying this, she rose on her tiptoes and playfully kissed Edward on the lips. John glared at them both before storming out of the apartment. The door slammed shut behind him. Wait, Nancy. 
Are you proposing to me? A bewildered Edward asked. And are you against it? countered Nancy. You'll never make up your mind on your own and we're running out of time. You'll take all three of us, won't you? I'd be honoured. Edward smiled. Two lonely people were no longer alone in this world. Happiness comes in different forms, and it seems to be smiling on them. There's no doubt this family will succeed.